Hello, so this is um, video number three of section 7.2. Um, so here I just want to introduce one, well, I guess technically five definitions, um, but they're all very related. Uh, then I want to uh, prove a nice theorem related to this definition and then do some examples. Um, so what we're about to talk about is extremely applicable. Um, I actually use uh, some of this in my own research, uh, but certainly after sort of discussing each of these definitions, I think it'll be a little apparent why uh, we would want to apply these definitions. So if I've got a quadratic form Q of X, we call Q positive definite if Q of X is strictly greater than zero for all non-zero vectors X. So that is, you can kind of think if we think of Q as this function that acts on vectors of length n, the value that this function takes on is never um, zero or a negative number, right? And so certainly, you know, when we were studying, when studying normal x, y functions, uh, this is something we definitely want to know about a function, right? Is this function ever positive? Is it negative? Um, and so sort of as an analog to the positive definite definition, we say that a quadratic form is positive semi-definite if there's one sort of uh, minor difference here that we would allow this function to take on the value zero uh, but not take on any negative values. So positive definite strictly greater than zero, positive semi-definite greater than or equal to zero for all non-zero x. And so then we have a corresponding value for uh, q of x being less than or less than or equal to zero. So if Q is uh, negative definite, then Q is strictly less than zero for all non-zero X. If Q is negative semi-definite, then it is less than or equal to zero for all non-zero X. And finally, uh, we say that a quadratic form Q is indefinite if it takes on both positive and negative values. So most quadratic forms you'll probably see will be indefinite. Um, but certainly we've got these uh, classifications. And so um, I think often the book will say, classify the following quadratic forms. Let me double check, I've got the wording there correct. Yes. So we've got the following classifications for every quadratic form. And certainly you can see every quadratic form has to fall into one of these five categories. Um, so it is also common because remember a quadratic form will usually look like this. Um, we will also generally give these same definitions to this matrix A, right? So we'll say that A is a positive definite or positive semi-definite matrix if the value of X transpose A times X is greater than or equal to zero, for example. So this would mean that A is positive uh, definite. if the value of x transpose a times x is always greater than or equal to zero for this symmetric matrix A. Um, and so, like I was saying, in, in my own research, I actually uh, study positive semi-definite matrices, um, but certainly in, in lots of applications, it would be very good when using quadratic forms to be able to classify the quadratic form in this way, right? To have a matrix that you could sort of guarantee that this equation would always give you a positive number or a non-negative number or a negative number, one way or the other. So it's actually very hard, as we'll see a little bit later, to just look at the sort of stretched out equation version of a quadratic form and know what, uh, whether it's you know one of these, which category it falls in. So, how can we classify a quadratic form if just looking at the equation, it's, it's kind of hard to know how to do so? Well, it turns out there's a really nice theorem which will allow us to classify every quadratic form based on its matrix. And this is one of those theorems in math that like, I really don't think I would have ever thought of, I guess. Um, or, you know, I wouldn't have seen it unless I'd, you know, well, you'll see. It's very cool. 
So this is theorem five in chapter seven. And what this says is if we've got an n by n symmetric matrix A, and its corresponding quadratic form. Then, if all of the eigenvalues, well actually we'll do this, then Q is positive definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of A are positive. And so this, when I say are positive, I strictly mean greater than zero. Um, and it is positive semi-definite if the eigenvalues of A are non-negative. All right, well, it's also positive, or sorry, negative definite. If the eigenvalues of A are all negative, and negative semi-definite if the eigenvalues of A are non-positive And finally, indefinite if the eigenvalues of A are both positive and negative. So it turns out you can classify a quadratic form based entirely on the eigenvalues of the symmetric matrix of that quadratic form. So not only that, right, the values of those eigenvalues exactly mirror the values that the quadratic form takes on, right? So if we look at the values of the eigenvalues of A and all of them are strictly greater than zero, then the value of Q of X will always be strictly greater than zero. Similarly, if maybe the, there are some zero values, eigenvalues for A, but there aren't any positive eigenvalues, then the value of Q of X will always be less than or equal to zero. And so this is just really awesome because, you know, looking at this, you wouldn't think, you know, my first thought would be, well, obviously it's the eigenvalues of A. Um, but it turns out we can completely classify each quadratic form based entirely on the eigenvalues of its matrix. And so what I want to quickly do is prove this. All right, hello. So this is video number two of video number three part two of video number three of section 7.2. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, I paused the video for a second uh, while I was recording because um, they started vacuuming out in the hallway. Uh, and I'm not sure if the mic actually picked up on it, um, but it was just a little distracting. So I decided to just pause and 
wait for them to finish. Um, after this, I'm going to try and see if I can figure out how to splice the two videos together. Um, but anyways, uh, I had paused the last video at the proof for theorem 5, and so I've written it up on the board here, and so I want to quickly discuss it. So, remember, what we're trying to show is that the um, values of the eigenvalues of this matrix A for the quadratic form Q will determine or classify the quadratic form Q. So what we can do, if I've got this quadratic form Q of X equals X transpose A times X, um, remember that the principal axis theorem from last video lets us uh, perform a change of variable, X equals P times Y, where P is an invertible matrix, so that we can rewrite this quadratic form Q of X again, equal to x transpose a times x, as y transpose d times y. Um, a few things remember about this matrix d. This matrix is actually similar to a, right? We find this matrix d by orthogonally diagonalizing a uh, using this matrix p. So remember the matrix p is the uh, orthogonal matrix consisting of the eigenvectors of a. And so the diagonal entries, which I will label lambda 1 up through lambda n of d, are the eigenvalues of a. And so that's big, right? And what we're going to mostly do is focus on expanding this. So if I let y be this vector of variables here, um, where again y1 through yn are just individual potentially your individual variables which will take on real numbers of some sort then I can expand my entire quadratic form, Q of X, which was originally defined to be X transpose A times X. But after making a change of variable, remember we've said, okay, these two things are equal. And remember, like, these are the same function, just under a different basis, right? So we'd kind of discussed that, that the values here are the same. We're just looking at the vectors almost through a different lens. Um, so that you know, we can study this function a little better. And one of the reasons, when I expand y transpose times this diagonal matrix D times y, this is the expression I get. So I get lambda 1 times y1 squared plus lambda 2 times y2 squared all the way out to lambda n times yn squared. And so notice, because there's no cross product term in this expression, all of the terms contributed by this arbitrary vector y could contain positive, negative, any sorts of terms, all of the terms contributed by this vector y must wind up being positive in this expression. Right? y1 squared, no matter what the value of y1, is, I guess I should say, not positive, non-negative. Right? Because some of these could be 0. But remember, at the outset, we assumed, or at least for the purpose of defining positive semi-definite, definite, negative, semi-definite, definite, and so on, that the vectors we were looking at were non-zero. So at least, and because remember p is invertible, uh, p inverse times x, then if x is non-zero, will also not be zero. So this vector is not zero. Meaning at least one of these values pops up as a positive term in this quadratic form q. So if all of the eigenvalues of a are positive, this will always be positive. If some of them are zero, I can just basically make the correct y term zero and make this value zero, but it will never be negative, right? Because if none of these eigenvalues are negative, well, these y's aren't doing anything to change the sign of this equation. And so on the flip side, if all of these eigenvalues are positive or negative, excuse me, then this expression must be negative. This will be a sum of n negative numbers, which has to be negative. And so in this way, because we can express the quadratic form as this quadratic form with no cross product terms, the values of the eigenvalues of this matrix A will always completely classify the quadratic form. And so notice if, say, lambda 1 was positive and lambda 2 was negative, I just find a vector y such that you know y1 was equal to 0, y2 was equal to 1, everything else was equal to 0, this would be negative. 
then I could make y1 you know, positive, or y1 non-zero, y2 zero, and this would be positive, right? So if the eigenvalues were alternating by, in a sense, turning some of the um, values of these y values on or turning some of them off, I could change the sign of this expression. So that's theorem five. Uh, I just want to end with a few examples where we will actually classify some quadratic forms. And then we're also going to do, because uh, these somewhat mirror some homework problems you'll have, we'll then make a change of variable. X equals P times Y. That transforms. A quadratic form into one with no cross product term. All right, so the first quadratic form I want to look at is Q of X equals x1 squared minus 6 x1 x2 plus 9 x2 squared. So remember, by the previous theorem, if we can first calculate the matrix of this quadratic form, we can completely classify this quadratic form based on the eigenvalues of this matrix A. But we've already seen how to do this. A is equal to the following matrix. Um, I will uh, skip over calculating the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of this matrix um, just for time's sake. So the eigenvalues of this matrix are 0 uh, with a corresponding eigenvector v1 is equal to uh, the vector um, 3, 1, and lambda 2 equals 10 with corresponding eigenvector v2 equals negative 1, 3. All right, and so now we want to um, make a change of variable. So what we want to do is find an orthogonal matrix P that can transform A into, um, into, its, uh, into a diagonal matrix D so that the quadratic form that we transform it into has no cross product term. And so we're just going to let P be the matrix. Um, whose columns are the normalized eigenvectors of A. And I guess I should say, state before moving on, notice we now know the values of the eigenvalues, 0 and 10. So therefore, Q of x is positive semi-definite because there are no negative eigenvalues, but it takes on both positive and one zero eigenvalues. <laughs> 
So we'd classify it as positive semi-definite. Then under the change of variable, x equals p times y. Then q of x is equal to y transpose times d times y, which is equal to 10 y2 squared, because the matrix d is the matrix similar to a. using P to do the tr similarity transformation. So we can completely classify all quadratic forms um, by finding the eigenvalues of their corresponding matrix. At that point, we can calculate the eigenvectors, normalize them to find this orthogonal matrix P, which performs this similarity transformation so that Q times X is equal to Y transpose DY and we can transform a or transform q into a quadratic form with no cross product term. So on the worksheet, there are actually two more of these problems. Um, I'll post the solutions up on Canvas. Uh, so I highly encourage you to try them out on your own and then you can check them with the solutions. Uh, there will also be a few examples of these in your homework as well. Um, but yeah, so that wraps up section 7.2. And um, next we'll move on to our last section, section 7.4.